The jury is currently deliberating in Donald Trump's criminal trial out of New York. The judge gave the jury instructions this morning, and both sides presented their closing arguments yesterday. The defense attempted to poke holes in Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen's testimonies. The prosecution asked the jury to focus on the documents that corroborate Cohen's account. And we have team coverage of this case for you. Our Errol Barnett is at the courthouse in Lower Manhattan, and Jessica Levinson is with us to provide legal analysis. Errol, I'm going to start with you. Tell us what the atmosphere is like outside of the courthouse. Well, Lana, there are a few dozen pro-Trump supporters who've been here today, and we've seen those numbers both grow and shrink as this court uh, criminal trial has uh, twisted and turned um, through star witnesses and through closing arguments. And yesterday, we also saw uh, the Biden-Harris campaign bring forth people like actor Robert De Niro to speak and, and say that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. So the campaigning atmosphere is outside the courthouse, but inside right now, it's serious business for these 12 jurors who are sequestered in a private room and for the first time can discuss with each other their views on the case, the testimony, the evidence, and Donald Trump's ultimate guilt or innocence. And that kind of split screen is stark, especially when you consider that outside the courthouse, opinions have been split on whether or not Donald Trump is guilty. There was recent CBS News polling um, which showed that 56 percent of Americans actually do believe Donald Trump is guilty and committed a crime um, in that he was definitely or probably guilty. That did fall along party lines, as you might expect, with more Democrats believing Trump is guilty and more Republicans believing Trump is innocent. But then on the second question, it was more narrow. Will the jury find Donald Trump guilty in this case? Only 52 percent of respondents believe that this jury would find Trump guilty, either definitely or probably. Again, it's a majority, but it is a coin flip as far as public opinion. The jury got instructions from the judge this morning, Lana, to disassociate associate their bias, their opinions, their political leanings from this case, and only to apply the law as it is related to these 34 felony counts. And in order to, con to convict Trump, they must believe that he intended to falsify business records and did so in pursuit of another crime, which was to pursue office through unlawful means, which effectively is why the hush money payments and the repayment to Michael Cohen to cover it up is core to the prosecution's case. So now the jury has until about 4.30 p.m. today um, to come up with a verdict. And of course, if they don't, it spills into tomorrow until they can be unified on a decision. There's one juror who doesn't agree with the rest. We could end up with a, with a hung jury or a mistrial, um, which would be the worst case scenario for the prosecution. But if they come back quickly with a decision, that likely means the prosecution effectively made its case. So that's what we wait for at this hour. All right, I want to bring in Jessica for her take on this. So as you heard Errol saying, the jurors have been instructed to divorce their own feelings and opinions about the defendant, in this case, the former president, from the facts. So what are the major points that were made during the trial that the jury needs to actually consider in order to reach a verdict? Well, and I think Errol's so right to focus on that in the sense that we all know that jurors have views, they have their own personal bias. And the question isn't, can you erase that? The question is, can you do your job, which is to put that aside. And so to your question, you know, what are they looking at? Obviously, the testimony of Michael Cohen is going to be big in this case. For the prosecution, I think they're trying to minimize it. They're trying to show that there is a lot of other witnesses. There are a lot of other witnesses here, a lot of other evidence here. That's true. But Michael Cohen is somebody who explained the theory of the case and explained why these hush money payments were made and that this was not, in fact, made in order to make sure that Donald Trump's family or business partners didn't hear about allegations that he had an affair with Stormy Daniels. But instead, it was made to make sure the voters didn't hear about that story. And that brings me to the second, I think, big piece of evidence, which is actually the testimony by Stormy Daniels. And I had a very different reaction right as the reporting came out about that testimony versus afterwards. When we first heard what she said and that Judge Marchand thought maybe some of the testimony went a bit too far afield, I thought this could be really a weakness for the prosecution. But the more I think we all consider that testimony and all the details of that testimony, and frankly, the 
somewhat tawdry details of that testimony. I think that's exactly why the theory of the case makes sense in that do you really want to make sure, Donald Trump, that the public, the voting public doesn't hear that story, the details of that story, right after the Access Hollywood tape, right before voting. So those two witnesses, they were the higher profile witnesses, and I think they were also the more important witnesses as well. And Errol, you have been there inside the courthouse, outside of the courthouse, reporting for us as all of these major movements have taken place in the course of the, the testimony. I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more, to Jessica's point, about even what we saw from the defendant or from the judge and the jurors as those key witnesses were in front of the stand. And, and talk to us also a little bit about Donald Trump's decision not to be among the witnesses, not to take to the stand. Part of the juror's calculation, Lana, right? And, and for the most part, it comes down to common sense. On the part of Donald Trump deciding not to testify, you know, the jurors were instructed by the judge this morning to not take that as evidence of his innocence or guilt, to not hold that against him. Um, all defendants have a right to uh, prevent themselves from any self-incriminating um, testimony. And so they were told to disregard that. But to Jessica's point on testimony from Stuart Stormy Daniels or other witnesses um, who were by the Trump team told uh, were untrustworthy, the jury's going to really decide that for themselves. And I think one of um, the I don't know about if it's strange, but one of the defense's witness, and they only called two, uh, was Robert Costello. And he was one of the last voices the jurors uh, were able to hear before they broke for the Memorial Day weekend. And the defense brought that witness forward to poke holes in Michael Cohen's testimony. But upon cross-examination and testy exchanges with the judge, they almost made the prosecution's case and point that Donald Trump was the mastermind of a scheme to gain an election through unlawful means and did so through corrupting his lieutenants and Trump only valued loyalty above all else. And as soon as Trump got a sense that someone was not being loyal, he would turn on them. And so for Robert Costello to say, Michael Cohen can't be trusted, uh, Michael Cohen wanted to work with us, and then to have some recordings played that um, I think Robert Costello at some point said, I wasn't upset that Michael Cohen wasn't going to be represented by me. And then they played an exchange in which he was extremely upset and used some profanity and said, who the, the expletive does he think he is? Does he not know he's now working against one of the most powerful men in the world? That effectively made the prosecution's case. And so that will all feed into not just the letter of the law and how the jurors are looking at these 34 felony counts, but what's reasonable? What's common sense? What's most likely uh, the judge instructed the jurors that they can factor that into their calculations as they deliberate today? So kind of ironic that some of the witnesses who may have been risky for the prosecution ended up working out, and some of the witnesses who were for the defense may have actually helped the prosecution make its case. Um, Jessica, our viewers just saw as Errol was discussing this, the uh, graphic that depicted the defense arguments from Donald Trump's legal team. Regardless of what the jury ends up uh, handing up to the judge at the end of this deliberation, we expect that there is going to be um, an appeal by the Trump legal team if it is, in fact, a guilty verdict. Talk to us about what that would mean in terms of the appeals process, how lengthy that could be, and, and how that might affect the fact that he's also running for president. So if there is a conviction, I think what we should all expect is that there would not be an immediate sentence of, and now you go to prison, that I don't think any of us should expect that, again, if there is a conviction, that we're going to be talking in a few days or weeks about when the former president is going to report for his time uh, in being incarcerated. And you pointed to the appeal, and that's part of the reason here. And so if there is a conviction, uh, Absolutely, there will be an appeal. And on what basis? So I think that there will be an appeal in part on the idea that there were some problems with the jury selection, and maybe there were some jurors who should have been removed for probable cause, excuse me, for cause, but that they weren't, uh, meaning that they couldn't be fair. I think there will also be 
um, appeals focusing on the novelty of this particular case, the idea that we're talking about state crimes that were allegedly committed by a federal candidate for office, and that part of those state crimes are predicated on federal violations, for instance, violations of the Federal Campaign Finance Act. So I think there'll be some questions about kind of all of the steps that the jury has to take and whether or not those are appropriate in a state prosecution of a federal candidate. And then I think that there will be some, um, there will be an appeal in part based on what I just talked about and Stormy Daniels' testimony, the idea that she went far beyond what you would need in a quote unquote paper case. But the appeal itself could stay any sentence. Uh, that is a possibility here. So I'm going to end where I began, which is even if we see a conviction, I don't want people to think, what's the first day he's going to be inside a prison cell? It's not going to, I don't think it's going to look that way. Okay. Jessica, before we let you go, though, uh, you actually interviewed retired Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer last night at a time when the legitimacy of our legal system is being hotly debated, uh, and especially questions about current sitting justices. I'm, I'm curious about uh, what the former justice had to tell you. Well, he didn't talk specifically about his colleagues. He didn't say anything like, I'm deeply troubled by, <laughs> you know, Justice Alito or Justice Clarence Thomas, because of course he's not going to. But this is a justice who cares about the integrity of the court. And frankly, they all do. If we listen to what they're saying, they all understand that this entire experiment of there are unelected people who are head of one of our three branches who make these incredibly important decisions that impact our lives. It's not just gun control. It's not just abortion. It's also the environment. It's immigration. It's the freedom of speech. It's equal protection. They make all of these huge decisions. They all understand we need to respect them. One of the things that I got to talk about with Justice Breyer is the idea that even though there's this push for a code of a mandatory ethics code, it's not so easy legally speaking. It's not so easy to find a new body to oversee the overseers. They are the Supreme Court in the Constitution. They have the final word. And for me, that was a, a really fascinating part of the conversation to hear him say, we need to do something, but let's be careful about this political push for a mandatory code of ethics. All right. Very interesting. And what a rare opportunity. Jessica and Errol. Thank you both.